This video is brought to you by Star Conflict, a free, fast-paced online space action game featuring large-scale battles. Play Star Conflict for free and support this show and get a Black Hawk spaceship and three days of account boost. As a bonus, there is a link below. Somo Yamaguchi died from stomach cancer. The cancer part perhaps isn't surprising, given that Yamaguchi is currently the only person officially recognized by the Japanese government as having lived through the atomic bombings of both Hiroshima and Nagasaki. What is surprising, given that history, is that Yamaguchi avoided the disease for so long, not dying until January 4, 2010, at the age of 93. So, how did Yamaguchi find himself at both locations during two respective blasts? Well, at the age of 29, Yamaguchi was on his way back home from a three-month-long business trip to Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. At the time, he was an engineer for Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, specifically working as an oil tanker designer. On his way to the train station to head back to his home in Nagasaki, he noticed he had forgotten his travel permit and went to get it, while his colleagues, Akira Iwanaga and Kuniyoshi Sato went on. He picked up his pass and was on his way back to the station when at 8.15 a.m. he saw a bomber flying over the city and two small parachutes. Then a rush of blinding light, sound, wind, and heat knocked him to the ground. Mr. Yamaguchi had the misfortune of being approximately three kilometers from a nuclear blast. The immediate effects of this were his eardrums rupturing, temporary blindness, and burns over much of his upper body. After his initial disorientation, and in spite of his injuries, Yamaguchi managed to make his way to an air raid shelter where he met up with two of his colleagues who had also survived the blast. He spent the night in the shelter, and in the morning, he and his co-workers headed back to Nagasaki via train as originally planned. When he arrived, he received bandage treatment from a local hospital and even felt well enough to report for work on August the 9th, just three days later. Just have a think about that the next time you stay home because you've got a cold. Of course, Yamaguchi had to explain his burns to his co-workers. His boss was in disbelief over his claim that it was a single explosion that destroyed much of Hiroshima. You're an engineer, he said to Tsutomu. Calculate it. How could one bomb destroy an entire city? The boss spoke too soon. According to Yamaguchi, during this conversation, the air raid sirens went off, and then, once again, he saw a blinding white light. He dropped to the floor immediately. He was now familiar with the drill. Yamaguchi stated, I thought the mushroom cloud had followed me from Hiroshima. Both bombs exploded near the city centers and, interestingly enough, were about three kilometers away from Yamaguchi's position at the time. Despite the explosion being slightly more powerful than the one at Hiroshima, 21 kilotons versus 16 kilotons at Hiroshima, thanks to the city's uneven terrain and the fact that many parts of the city were divided by water, which prevented the extensive fire damage that happened in Hiroshima, there wasn't nearly the same amount of overall infrastructure damage. Yamaguchi himself experienced no immediate injury from the second explosion explosion, though of course was exposed to another high dose of ionizing radiation and medical supplies to treat his existing burns were now in short supply. Interestingly, Yanaguchi almost didn't have to go through the ordeal twice. Nagasaki was not the original target for the second nuke. That was the city of Kokura. However, thanks to cloud covering Kokura when the bomber arrived, they had to divert to a secondary target, Nagasaki, as the mission stipulated that they were not to drop the bomb unless they had a visual of the target. When the bomber arrived at Nagasaki, they also found significant cloud cover, but because they were low on fuel, it was not possible to divert to another target, so they made their run anyways, despite the orders. When they got close just before releasing, they did have a brief visual to confirm their location before dropping the bomb. Had they had more fuel, or had there not been cloud cover over Kokura, Yamaguchi, and not an insignificant portion of the Japanese population, would have had their lives drastically changed, some for the better, and some for the worse. Surprisingly, unlike so many others who experienced even just one of the blasts, Yamaguchi went on to live a long and productive life, with the only major permanent physical health problem as a result of the bombings being the loss of hearing in his left ear, though the burns took some time to heal. Temporarily, he lost all of his hair and experienced a great deal of psychological trauma, as one might expect. He and his wife, Asako, even went on to have children who all turned out to be perfectly healthy, which, at least at the time, not so much today, was thought to be something of a miracle, considering both parents had been exposed to such high levels of ionizing radiation. Yamaguchi's wife lived to 88, dying of kidney and liver cancer. Yamaguchi himself lived to the ripe old age of 93 years old and, for most of his life, made little mention of the fact that he had been present at both bombings. 
officially just registered as a survivor of Nagasaki. According to one of his daughters, his reasoning for downplaying this and not registering as a survivor of Hiroshima as well was his robust health through most of his life. He felt it would be disrespectful to the many thousands who were not so lucky health-wise. Once in his 80s, he changed his stance, breaking his silence on the matter and officially applying for recognition as a survivor of both blasts. This was granted by the Japanese government in 2009, shortly before his death. He then dedicated the rest of his life to campaigning for the disarmament of nuclear weapons for all nations. He even wrote a book outlining his experience, which included many poems that he wrote about the event. It's called Raft of Corpses. Despite it all, Yamaguchi considered himself lucky. As he said shortly before his death, I could have died on either of those days. Everything that follows is a bonus. Now the chances are you're not going to be nuked twice, but if you want to do some battle, stick with video games. And with that in mind, before we get into the bonus facts section today, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Star Conflict. In Star Conflict, you can take part in epic space battles where you can fly over 240 spaceships from four different factions. There's loads of different ships to choose from, so you can find something that matches how you like to play. Whether you prefer, you know, more of a big old destroyer or maybe it's something more nimble like an interceptor, there's a lot to choose from. From. So what can you do in the game? Well, P2P, cooperative raids, it's all open world as well, so loads of different things, lots of danger, lots of rewards. It's a game that's super easy to get into, you can just load up and start playing, but it's also tricky to master, so there's lots of room for developing skill. It's lots of fun, it's free, it's a great way to support the show, and you get a black hot spaceship for free, and three days of a premium account boost. Just click the link below to get started, and let's get into that bonus fact. Ever wonder why nuclear bombs create a mushroom-shaped cloud? Well, want to know more? This phenomenon all comes down to a little something called the Rowley-Taylor instability, and by extension, convection. It all starts with an explosion that creates a pyrocumulus cloud. This ball of burning hot gases is accelerated outwards in all directions. Since the burning ball of accelerated gases is hotter and therefore less dense than the surrounding air, it will begin to rise, in the case of nuclear explosions, extremely rapidly. This ultimately forms the mushroom cap. As the ball rises, it will leave behind air that is heated, creating a chimney-like effect that draws in any smoke and gases on the outer edge of the chimney. Convection in action there. Visually, this forms the stipe, the stalk, of the mushroom. The perception that the mushroom cap is curling down and around the stipe is primarily a result of the differences in temperatures at the center of the cap and its outside. The center is hotter and therefore will rise faster, leaving the slower outer edges to be caught up in the stipe convection's awesome attributes. Once that cloud reaches a certain point in our atmosphere where the density of the gas cloud is the same as the density of the surrounding air, it will spread out, creating a nice cap. So this all brings me to the shorter yet more geeky answer. The entire process is something that describes the Rayleigh-Taylor instability. This instability is well known in physics and in general describes the merging between two different substances, mainly liquids and gases, that have different densities and are subjected to acceleration. In the case of an atomic bomb, the acceleration and the hotter gases creating the differing densities of material are caused by the explosion. From this, you might have guessed that you don't necessarily need an atomic bomb to create a mushroom cloud. All you need is enough energy delivered rapidly, in this case an explosion, that creates a pocket of differing densities of material, in this case heated gases. There are numerous other examples in our world that create and are described by the same phenomenon that gives us this formation. For instance, the magnetic fields of planets, the jet stream of winds that help control our planet's climate, the sound of snapping shrimp, even our understanding of certain different forms of fusion can all be attributed to Rayleigh-Taylor instability. Now, you might have also noticed that nuclear explosions, besides producing this frightening fungal formation, also sometimes result in a cloud ring around the mushroom cap. What's going on here is that a low pressure area is created via the negative phase of the shock wave, the phase that follows the wave of compressed gases at the leading part of the shock wave. This results in a drop in temperature, which, along with a low pressure, can potentially lower the dew point sufficiently for a temporary cloud to form. This cloud halo around the explosion is known as a Wilson cloud, named after the Scottish physicist Charles Wilson, who invented the Wilson cloud chamber where similar sorts of things can be observed. And now for another bonus fact. 
The bomb that hit Nagasaki was called Fat Man, and many claim that it was named after Winston Churchill. This claim has been debunked by none other than the namer of the bomb, physicist Robert Serber, who stated he named Fat Man such simply because of its shape. Serber also named Little Boy the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, please do support us by supporting Star Conflict. They're linked to below. And as always, thank you for watching.